And so the Apostle Paul tells us in our reading from Colossians, set your mind on things above and not on things of this earth. Does this mean we shouldn't save for our children's education? Does this mean we shouldn't put money away for a rainy day or for retirement? Does this mean we shouldn't make plans to enjoy life and have some recreation? If we look at our gospel reading, we might ask ourselves, does this mean that it is a sin to build a bigger barn? Well, the answer, as is always the case, is yes and no. Saving for the future is indeed something that is commended by Scripture. Putting things away for a future time is a noble thing. It's a virtue, as we see in the story of Joseph. Joseph, who is in Egypt, and he goes to Pharaoh and he presents a plan to store things for the future because a famine is sure to come. And so we better save now so that we will have plenty to eat later. Joseph is commended for his wisdom and his ability to save, to store. Likewise, Jesus' parable of the talents is instructive to us on how to be a wise steward of God's gifts, to invest and to grow these gifts so that the return can be rewarded. We are not called to simply bury God's gifts, but rather we are called to use them, and to use them with the wisdom that God has granted us, that these gifts may be of benefit to our neighbor. And that, then, is the key. Saving and investing for the future benefit of our neighbor is far different than the man that Jesus speaks of in his parable for today. This man has no regard for his neighbor, but rather he only thinks about his own selfish security, his own selfish pleasure, his own selfish comfort in the future. He has all this excess grain. All the, the fields have produced an abundance this year. And the man's first thought isn't, who can I give this extra to? Where can I find the hungry, the needy? Where can I find a place to give people these things? No, his first thought is, I will tear down the barn I have and build a bigger barn so I can keep these things all for myself. As is so often the case with Jesus' words, he is warning us against a form of idolatry. Jesus is giving us a better way, that is, a better God to put our fear, love, and trust in. The idolatry of our future is a false God that can certainly tear us away from trusting in our true God. And God will remind us that our future, the future, the whole future, even ours, is in his hands. And, and God has plans for that future. These are plans for our welfare and not for evil. Plans to prosper us and not to harm us. Plans to give us hope and a future. Now, as we often do, we interpret these words of Scripture in a worldly way. We hear that God has plans to prosper us, to give us a future, and we immediately think about the things of this world, don't we? We think about success and wealth, prosperity and abundance in this life. We think about riches and earthly goods. But these are not the plans that God has for us. The plans that God has for us are so much more. When God says that he has plans for our future, he is talking about our eternal future, our heavenly future, our forever future. 
That future is not of this world, but rather he gives us the promise of treasures in heaven. And these treasures in heaven do not call us to idleness here on earth. These treasures in heaven do not simply demand of us to relax and to eat and drink and be merry without any regard for our neighbor. They do not encourage laziness or greed, but rather to use our God-given vocations to provide a service to our neighbor, indeed to love our neighbor in whichever ways our life, work, and possessions enable us to love them. And indeed, our vocations are a gift from God. Our callings in life are a gift from God. As teachers begin to think about starting another school year, this is their vocation. The vocation of teaching, of instructing, of bringing knowledge to another generation of young people. This is a godly task. It is service to their neighbor, using what God has given them and giving out so that others can benefit. Think about your vocations, your positions in life, whether it's your job, your relationships, those things that God has called you to do. How in those vocations can you be of service to others, to your neighbor, whether that neighbor is a child, your child, your family members, your literal neighbors, the people that live next door to you, or anybody that God has brought into your path. How has God called you to be of service to them? But above all, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we must not lose sight of what our Jesus has done for us. Take heart. Be comforted in the knowledge that our Lord Jesus left his treasures in heaven in order to claim his treasures here on earth. You, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, are those treasures. Jesus delights in you, and you are what he has worked so hard for. Jesus left his heavenly treasures in order to become a man, to die for your sins, for our sins of greediness and laziness and covetousness and idolatry. Jesus left his treasures in heaven in order to secure his plan for your salvation, his plan to prosper you and not to harm you, his plan to give you hope and a future. And he knew that this plan meant the cross for him. It meant suffering and death. And so, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross so that you might have a secure, eternal future, a heavenly hope, an eternal future with our Lord and our Savior in the presence of God, where you may rest eat, drink, and be merry. Yes, with your treasures in heaven, you have the promise that you will one day rest from your labors in the presence of God. You will be able to relax in the hands of God, in the, in the nearer presence of God. And you will eat and drink in the banquet that is set before you. And you will be merry in the everlasting joy and eternal treasure that God has planned for you in the presence of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.